that the Lord uh, brought to my attention. And it is uh, actually going back. Although today we're Genesis 18. I want to go back in the Torah to Genesis 12. Although I teach last week on Lech Lecha. Um, I want to deal, now that we're in smaller, smaller group and smaller setting. I want to deal with fundamental theological things that uh, perhaps I was not teaching on before. And we're going to go today. Uh, um, Mark, do you have the New Testament in this? Can I borrow this? Is that possible? We're actually going to go today to, to a very, very difficult passage. Uh, our main text is going to be Genesis 12, but this important passage is going to be from Galatians. Okay? Chapter that I'm sure uh, some of you are. Oh, look at that. I'll open it right to the spot. Right to the chapter. Uh, to this chapter. I want it to be interactive today. I want to hear your thoughts on this as well. And we're going to go to Galatians chapter 3. And Galatians ch chapter 3. And I suppose we can start in verse 15 in Galatians. There's one verse that I, I would like to talk about today, but I think we need to read the proper context of this entire thing in Galatians 3. Okay? And it's not the verse you think it is either. But let me read it with you. I'm in Galatians 3.15. It says, To give human examples, brothers, even with a man-made covenant, no one annuls it or adds, adds to it once it has been ratified. Now, the promises were made to uh, Abraham and to his offspring. It does not say and two offsprings, referring to many, but referring to one. And to your offspring who is Messiah, this is what I mean. The law, the Torah, which came 430 years afterward, does not annul covenant previously ratified by ratified by, by God so as to make the promise void for it, it, it's the inheritance come by the Torah it no longer comes by promise but God gave it to Abraham by a promise why then there is a, the, 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 the law, the Torah it was added because of transgression until the offspring should come to whom the promise had been made and and it was put in place through angel by an intermediary. Now an intermediary implies more than one, but God is one. Is there a law then contrary to the promises of God? Certainly not. For, it's, for if a law had been given that could give life, then righteousness would indeed be by the Torah. But the scripture imprisoned everything under, under the scene, so the promise of faith by Yeshua Mashiach might be given to those who believe. Now before faith comes, we were held captive under the Torah, imprisoned under the, the coming faith would be revealed. So then the Torah was our guardian until Yeshua came in order that we might be justified by faith. But now that faith had come, we are no longer under a guardian for in Yeshua Mashiach, you are all sons of God through faith. For as many of you as were immersed into Yeshua and put on Yeshua, there is neither a Jew or a Greek, there is neither slave or free, there is neither male or female, for you are all who in Yeshua HaMashiach. And listen to the last verse. This is the verse that I want to talk about today. And if you are in Messiah, then you are Abraham offsprings, heirs according to the promise. Here, take this. What an interesting, and I, ha I want to say even a difficult set of verses to understand. Now I think everybody understands that Yeshua doesn't say, uh, I mean, Shaul doesn't say in these verses there's no differences between you and your wife. Of course, there are differences between you and your wives. Anatomically, there are differences between you and your wife. He doesn't say that there are no differences between Jew and Gentile either. 
Otherwise, he wouldn't write a book called the book to the Romans and would write a book to the Hebrews. Of course, there are differences. However, what he's saying here, and in terms of the salvation, the salvation, there are no differences whatsoever between Jewish believer and a non-Jewish believer. Okay? But the verse that I want to focus on and ask you the question, he says, if in the Messiah you are in, you are part of the seed of Abraham according to the promise. What do you think that means? Anybody? What do you think that means? You say, if you're in Messiah, you are part of this promise. What do you think that means? All nations will be blessed through him, okay. But wh- what does it mean? Well, 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 let me ask you this question. What is the promises? What are those promises? The, the promise that we are like Abraham. We are looking for a city whose builder... Where are the promises written? Where are the promises written? Verse 2. Verse. Well, no, no, I'm asking a more generic. Where are the promises written? Where specifically? Deuteronomy Which call what? What Deuteronomy call? Which, what is it called? It's called the Torah. Right? In the Torah, all the promises to Israel were given in one place. It's a consolidated place. It's called in the Torah. Okay? The promises and the blessings. So in essence, what he's saying here, those are in Messiah are what? They have a right to the same promises that are given to Israel. That, that is the point. That is, that is the, mo- the point. True Yeshua... You know, Ephesians 2 says that through Yeshua, those from the nation are no longer called strangers. They're called what now? They're called friends because Messiah came and broken the barrier of, he's taking, he's taking the barrier, okay? But I want to ask you the question, where the truly the promises have started? Are they starting in Torah? Are they starting in the beginning of Torah? It started in uh, Genesis 3.15. No, it started... It's actually, no, it started in Genesis 12. It started when God says this. Let's turn, and I want to show you something amazing. The promises are the Torah. Promises are the Torah, but I want to really challenge today this idea when the Torah is even started. It says, I want you to pay very close attention. It says, now the Lord says into Abraham, what he said to Abraham, get out of your country, right? From you at kind, thy kinder and from your father's house unto the land that I show you. And I will make you a great nation and I will bless you. And I will make your name what? Great. And you will be what? A blessing. And I will bless all the, the I, will ble- I will bless them that bless you. And those who curse you, I will curse. And in you shall all the family of the earth be blessed. I want you to take, don't write in your Bible, I I want you to highlight this term. In all the families of the earth, you, you shall be blessed. Okay? This is a key verse. Because... This particular verse, I'm going to shock you in a minute. And I'm going to tell you the Torah did not start it with Moses. The Torah started at this point in time. As you're going to see something. What is the word here in the Hebrew? The word in Hebrew, read. Vanivrachu becha kol mishpachot adama. I often... You know, uh, give you commentaries from others. But I have uh, uh, heard a midrash this week that I never heard before. From Rabbi Ginsburg. He's one of the chief rabbis of Israel. The title of his message was the redemption of the redemption and the Gentiles. 
I've never heard an uh, uh, Orthodox Jew speak like that. And he brought up this particular verse. And I want to share with you what he shared. Because I found it so shocking. That I think it's something that I believe the Holy Spirit was speaking through him. The term here, Vanivrechu Becha. Nivrechu Becha. What does it mean? It does not mean all the nations will be blessed. I want to read you what the Talmud says about this verse. Rabbi Eliezer said, okay, he speak Rabbi Eliezer, what is the meaning? Vanivrechu Becha, all the nation will be blessed. The word Nivrechu does not mean to bless, it's come from the word Lahavriach. What is la avriach? Avriach is a process that you do when you plant a vine. You know how do, what they do in Israel? They, plant, they grow a vine and they take the branch of a vine and they break the branch of the vine and they take it and they grow this, the, same, the same to start another vineyard. That's what he's talking about. He's saying the word here la avriach He's talking about a process to take something, to break this, and then take it and graft it in somewhere else. And in this particular process, according to Rabbi Eliezer, there are two branches. Rabbi Eliezer say that there are two branches that are taking broken and then they are being grafted in into Abraham. And who are those two branches? Anybody want to take a guess? I'm going to give you a, a, a guess. None of them are Jews. <laughs> think about the two branches. Who do you think are historic figures? They are both women. Who is, would you say, one of the most influential Root is number one. Gling, gling, gling. Root. Because according to the Midrash, Rabbi Elias, those two branches are the one who will bring Messiah to the world. Wow. What an amazing Midrash this is. One of them is Root, the Moavia. Who was the Who, who was Root? The grandfather. The grand, not grandfather. The grandmother. <laughs> the grandmother of <laughs> David Amelech, which will receive Mashiach from. Root is number one. Who is going to get number two? I will be really impressed. I give you one. I give. Don't go yet. No Jewish. Okay, I'll give you a clue. It's one of the thousand wives of Shlomo Amelech. Oh. Who was Rechavam? Rechavam, the king mother. You guys don't know your Bible. Her name was Neamah. Neamah. Neama was Shlomo's wife, Rechavam mother. It is a matter of fact, it's written in the Midrash. Listen to this. According to the Midrash, you have to look up Neama. Her name means pleasantness, by the way. According to the Midrash, it is written in the Midrash. What? No, 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 no. She was the wife of Shlomo, I said. The wife of Shlomo, not the mother of Shlomo. The wife of Shlomo. The mother of Rechavam, the king. The mother of Rechavam. According to the Midrash, and who was Naamah? She was from whom? What, uh, what people? Ammonite. The Ammonim. Wicked, 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 wicked. But the Midrash teaches us, it's amazing, that... From all the wives of Shlomo, she is the only one who will have 
and her name in the kingdom. The only, the only one from all these thousand wives, according to the, to the Midrash, that her name is known into the, in, in, into the kingdom. Her, it's the heavenly name of Naamah. Actually, if you read in Jewish, it's not calling Messiah ben David, but listen how we call him often in rabbinic writing. Messiah ben David, Veshlomo Derech Neamah. That's his title. Towards from Neamah. You know, that's often. But in this case, it says here in the verse that this is, I'm giving you a midrash. I hope you're following it. It says, I want to bring you back so you understand where I am. It says, and I will bless you that ble- that and I will bless them that bless thee, and him that curse thee, which I curse, and in thee shall all the families of the earth will be blessed. All the, this term, be blessed, is talking about two blessings. The two blessings. And those two blessings are Naamah, according to Jewish understanding, and Ruth, who will bring the Messiah of Israel to the world. Yeshua. Isn't that amazing? Keep on reading with me though. I'm continue. Are you guys following me? Where is yeah. this? Where, can you take us to the passage? Would it be in, um, uh, where would it be for Solomon? For, for I actually have that. Let me keep on going because I have a lot of stuff That's to get through. Let, 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 let's keep on going. Okay. But the word, you see the word brichot Blessing, what we call, consider bre- blessing, brichot, bracha, to bless. Brichot is those two pieces that, that are being broken. And let me show you what's happened here, how this process, and you will be able to connect it to Galatians in, in, in a minute. It says here, verse 5. I want you to pay close attention. And it says, Abraham took Sarai, Okay, and his wa- Sarai, his wife, and Lot, his brother's son, and all their substance that they had gathered. He and the souls that they had gotten in Haran, and they went forth to go into the land of Canaan, and into the land of Canaan they came. Do you, everybody see the term here that they said, all the souls? That they have gotten. Everybody see those words? That's not what this, uh, it says. It says in the Hebrew. It says. Et anefesh. The souls. Who they made. The soul that made. What does it mean? That it says Abraham made souls. Abraham and Sarah made souls. What does it mean? Exactly. This is what the verse is talking about. In this essence, in the context, what, what, the, what, what, what the rabbis teach us, that the Abraham start converting Saul into Judaism, in essence. Right there. Sarah was converting the women. Abraham was converting the men. In essence, they said to Judaism, but in essence, it is to the God of Abraham, to the God of Isaac, to the God of Jacob, you know, so, so, well, of course, Abraham, Isaac and Jacob were not existing, get, get, but the God of Abraham. You see, this term, et anefesh asubicha, we read an amazing commentary about this particular vase, verse. The, this is, this is a, a commentary that is written, you know, the Talmud, it says Rabbi Eliyahu, you know who wrote it, Eliyahu, Elijah, in essence, they believe it came from Elijah. Elijah the prophet. And it says this. The world is divided to 6,000 years. The world is only 6,000 years ago. The first 2,000 years, according to Rabbi Eliyahu, they call the years of To, or the years of chaos. Okay? Why chaos? What does it mean chaos? It doesn't talk about chaos of creation. From the creation to a point, a year, 2,000 year, year, year of chaos. And the reason there is a chaos, because there is not connection between souls. There's no connection between people. Each person is for himself, in essence. Okay, Each one for himself. 
And you even read it, you know, you're going to see that before, as I'm going to show you, even with Noah, you know, Noah was really doing things. He said he was righteous in his generation, you know. You know, he wasn't doing it for people. He was doing it really to be obedient for God. The second 2,000 years are called the years of Torah. And the last 2,000 years called the years of Mashiach. Now, you might ask, according to this Midrash, this Midrash was giving commentary to where the 2,000 years of Torah starts. When do you think the 2,000 years of Torah started? Do you think Saturn with Moses? No, when would they? Exactly, according to the rabbis, it's amazing that it started when Abram said he didn't make the souls. He converted the souls. That is the exact moment in Jewish history that, that it started. That the Torah started. How do I know that? How do we know that? We know that very easily. Very easily to be a factual understanding. First of all, you might want to know how there is how, how do we know there are only 6,000 years what the rabbis tell us is right? They're absolutely right. If you take Genesis 1-1 one, one, and you read it in Hebrew, Bereshit bara Elohim et HaShemayim et HaAretz, you get the letter Aleph six times. Six. The Aleph not represents just one, it represents 1,000 also. 1,000 Aleph, 6,000. There are 6,000 years. We know that. And when did it start? When Torah started? I want you to think about it. The essence of the entire Torah. That's why I went back today to a, a Midrash I teach about last week. Because the essence of the entire Torah is in Genesis 12. In this verse. I will bless. The essence of the Torah. Now what did it says? It says, we know according to the Talmud, that Abraham born, we know exactly what year it's born. It's recorded in the Talmud. Anybody know what year Abraham was born? That's another shocking thing. This is not the invention of the rabbi. It's been going on for years and years and years. Abraham was born 1,000 it's, it's miraculous. Abraham was born exactly in 1948. Another great event in history occurred in the year 1948. Are you following me? Yes. Abraham born, if you start, the first 2,000 years are called the years of chaos. The second 2,000 years called the year of Torah. And the last one called the years of Messiah. Abraham was born exactly according to the Talmud. The this 1948. But wait a second. We can deduce something else here. We can deduce something else from this thing. If he was born in 1948, and the rabbis already told us that the first 2,000 years is called the years of chaos, and the moment that he starts converting un-Jewish souls to, into Judaism, means his answer to the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, God of Abraham, that the age of Torah started, what can we deduce? How old was Abraham? Exactly. And this is also significant age. See how significant this is? Woo! I got excited, Liam. Okay, just a second. Technical limitation here. I made a mess. I really appreciated the water, though. Is it possible to get some more water? <laughs> or now you're not going to give me more water? Yeah, it's probably wise. Yeah. I want to make sure you understand this. Year, the first, the first, Abraham was born, according to the Talmud, in the year 1948. Right. The Midrash says that the first 2,000 years were the years of chaos. Okay, the years of chaos. But the chaos, we, we, we move from the chaos to the, what's called the age of Torah, when Abraham, as it says here, he have taken all the, created all the souls. This is Genesis 12. Five. And they said, so that's why we know that Abraham was 52 years old when he started to convert souls into the God of Abraham, into the God of Israel. Everybody follow me? It's amazing. 
It's absolutely amazing. Yeah. What? You're 52? You're in good company. You start converting souls into the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob now. You're in the age that you can start doing it, Wes. Matter of fact, this is an important age. There are two other important figures that lived 52. And Wes, I, I wish you 120. Uh, anybody know? 52 is a significant number in Hebrew. King Solomon, the Davidic kingdom, also was 52 years old. Samuel, the prophet, was also 52 years old. And the Torah began from the sacrifice that Abraham made toward the Gerim to make them Gerit Tzedek, righteous Gentiles in essence. Judaizing, whatever term you want to use, to the God of Israel. Why I'm bringing this today to you? This, this is this. I was thinking about it. What is the essence of the Torah? What's the word what's of the Torah? What's the word Torah? I, wa I want to bring it to us today. This is, this is the great commission, okay? This is truly the greatest great commission. To go, of course to go to the Jew first, but ultimately what the goal of Israel? The goal of Israel is to go to all the nations of the world and to be a lie to them, okay? And share with them the Torah of Messiah. Let me ask you a question. The word Torah... What word does come from? Torah. Tor Torah. No, in the Hebrew, what word? Hora'ah. It's come from the word Hora. Torah. What's Hora'ah? What's the different words between Hora'ah and Limud? Limud, like Talmud, Limud, it's something that you do on your own. It's something that you do to self-study. It's a self-study. You know, like you get a self-study book. But what Abraham introduced here in Genesis 12, he's the real Torah. And a real Torah, or a is not to instruct yourself. It's to instruct others. There's a big difference. Limud, to study... If you think that that's what Torah is, think again. We learn the essence of the Torah. That's why this chapter is such an amazing... We learn the essence of the Torah. The essence of the Torah is not to teach yourself. The essence of the Torah is what? To teach others. This is what it's saying. To instruct... You, know, you want to know what the greatness about Abraham has been? There have been other tzaddiks before, Noah, before Abraham. Noah was a tzaddik, but Noah did not teach anybody about the God of Israel. Abraham's greatness, he manifested the Torah by teaching others. That's what he's doing, and that's why I gave you this verse 5. He have taken souls, he have taken souls, specifically not Jewish souls, gentle souls, and he did what to them? No. He cut them from the root and he planted them. In essence, the rabbi teach that he took them and he put them right here in his heart with the God of Israel. So they were grafted in. And that is what Paul is talking about in Galatians chapter 3. He's saying what in, the, in chapter 3 here? He's saying again, it's saying, if you belong to Messiah, then you are Abraham's seed. In essence, what he said is if you are in Messiah, that's the third age, the, the age of Messiah, the Messianic age, you know, you cut and you put yourself in the, you're in the heart of the Messiah now. Of course you are. In essence, though, there is the problem. If we're in the age of Messiah, right, we're in the age of Messiah now, it's a cyclical process, you realize that? We must go back again. We must go back again to the age of Torah to bring the Messiah. We must. It's a cyclical process. It's not such a... Because we, we're in the age of Messiah now and Messiah is not here. You know, he's, he's not 
you know what I mean. It's, it's not returned yet. So we learned something really, really important about the essence of the Torah. And I was thinking about the entire ministry, really. For Jews, we want to win Jews to the Lord. But really, let us not be tainted from the ultimate goal of the Jewish people, which is to be light. Or like Goim, be light to the Gentiles. And take them and break them from all these things that they were fals falsified for 2,000 years and bring them back to the God of Israel. It's a mitzvah. As a matter of fact, I was so moved by Rabbi Ginsburg when he shared this, this similar message. He said, it's a shame. It's such a crime that we do not share Judaism with the, with the, with the Gentiles. Of course, what sharing Judaism to him and sharing Judaism to us, it's mean two different things. To him, it's mean to become an uh, Orthodox Jew. To me, it doesn't mean that. So, I want to ask the question. So, are you guys following me yes. so far? I have just a little bit more. That's really all what I plan. But, but now, the question becomes, what is the Messiah, if this is the essence of the Torah, then our entire outlook needs really need to be changed. We need to be sharing the Besorah. That should be really the, the, the entire core. Just like Abraham. Of, he say he taking souls. He literally taking souls and grafted them in, 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 into the God of Israel. You know, think about it. I, I read this and I, I really can't... Just, wow! If that's the essence of Torah, then most of us are not living Torah life because we are studying a self-study that's called Talmud. That's Talmud. That's not Torah. Torah means instruct others. You guys following that? Think about this. If you call yourself a Torah observant, I'm going to ask you how many souls have you shared the good news with? That's a Torah. That's the ultimate Torah. And matter of fact, Of course we study our own now. So you it, your children as you walk along the of way? Course, of course. Of course. No, no, no. I, I, I'm, not, I'm not saying this. You, you're missing. I'm not saying all of a sudden I'm, I'm becoming a Paul. I was a Peter and I'm becoming a Paul now. That's not what I'm saying at all. I am talking here about two parts. The part, number one, the calling of national Israel. Okay? Of course, we need to see the Jewish people coming to the Lord. That's to the Jew first. There, there's no doubt about that. But the point that I'm trying to stress here of national Israel. National Israel have a calling to be a nation of priests. A priest to who? A priest to themselves? A priest to the nations of the world who will come in Sukkot. Right? It says they will come in Sukkot. And they will do what in Sukkot? They will... Who, who do you think will put the sacrifices on the altar for the nations? We, the Jewish people we will do this. You know, to be, in essence, an intermediary between God and the, uh, 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 and, and the nation. But this idea of this grafting, taking the nation and breaking them, nivrechu, take a branch and break it, and take it. And it's literally what the, the, the Midrash says, Abraham took the branch and in essence, he put it under his heart. It's something that is an important, important for us, I think, as a messianic congregation. To, yeah. Absolutely. And that's to me part of the Great Commission, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. The point that I, I bring in it, because this is part of a series that I'm going to teach now, um, they call a... Uh, uh, the Gentiles in the end time, because I think there's a lot of uh, confusion. And well, in essence, you're saying that as a messianic community, we should be a light instructing our people, the Jewish people, that in the process, reaching the nations to point them to the God of Israel. Am I correct? Yeah, and I, I think I'm what I'm saying also, we should, not, we should encourage the Gentiles, you know, um, um, to, be, to be calling on the God of Israel, and to be grafted in. We should not make it difficult to, the, to those from, who are not from Jewish, Jewish heritage. A good example would be what you're doing tomorrow. You're going to be Absolutely. Absolutely. 
Absolutely. I, I think I was a little grieved. Um, I was invited, like I told you, to a theological uh, thing where a few synagogues says that if you're not Jewish, you cannot come to their service. They want to have 100% Jewish. And um, I, I really wanted to look because in January there will be a meeting, so I have to talk through those things. So as I start to prepare... That's great. Yeah, that will be a good. Uh, I rather not say it on tape. <laughs> I'll tell you. I'll tell you if you must know, but I rather not say anything on tape that can be used against me. Uh, so, so really, the question will become now. Okay, so, so th- there's one more third. There are the third step here that I want to conclude with. This step for today, I think, it will be sufficient. Okay, so we have the step. That w- you know, we know when Torah started. Torah did not start with Moshe Rabbeinu. Torah started when, when souls of the nation start coming to the God of Israel. That's the beginning of Torah. But what, now we're in Messianic age, right? In the, we're, we're in the last 2,000 years now. We're in the end of the last 2,000 years. We're in 5,700. We are almost done with the last 2,000 years. Let me ask you a question. What do you think then the purpose of the messianic ages. What do you think the purpose of the messianic ages? No, no, that's not what scripture says. That's the end, but this is an era. What about the era? Well, I think this is actually fitting really good with the one new man. All of this does, okay? In the one new man, you have to understand, though, a Jew still is a Jew, a Gentile is still a Gentile. There is no difference in terms of their salvation. They're all coming to, 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 to the kingdom the same way. But, you know, in Romans 9, specifically Paul talked to the Jews in Romans 9, verse 1 through 5. He said, to those from my own people, they, they, you know, the Jewish people, he says, to those who are giving the promises, the covenant, you know, the the issue is, you know, the nations are now coming in to this to this covenant. They can partake of those, okay? They can partake of it, but on the physical, you know, uh, the, the physical Israel is still uh, going to have some some specific callings, you know, as we saw in Zechariah 23, okay? Then one new man comes is when Abraham took the branch and then brought them and the Messiah came to those Gentiles, to the world. That's when the one new man really starts, in essence. Because they all joined Abraham. They all came to the land of Canaan. They all received the blessings with Abraham. You see right there, this plan of grafted in, it's right there in the scripture. Right there in Genesis 12. You cannot, you cannot go wrong with it. Abraham, in essence, took, took all those, those people under under its wings. Go ahead. That's repeated again when, you know, when, when uh, uh, I've always thought that when out of the Exodus when they crossed. And the mixed multitude came. You absolutely see that they did with a mixed multitude. Yeah, but you see even in the mixed multitude. Okay, so that's what we'll answer. Did those people who, who crossed the mixed multitude, did they receive the blessings? Yeah. Uh, absolutely. Yeah. But those people... They did come by faith, and they did receive the blessing, but those people never called Bnei Israel. Okay, they called Gerim. They, ke- they called Gerim. There's a term from them. They called Gerim. But even a Ger, and that's the point that he's making here in, ex- in Genesis 12, the Ger, if he is joining himself to the Jew, he's going to receive the same blessings of the Jew. Well, there's a lot of scriptures that talk about the separation between them. You know, uh, there's a lot of places like Exodus 12, 49 and Numbers 15, 15, when he says, Torah achat, uh, uh, there will be one Torah to you and those are among you, okay? But the point is it's still making, ex- uh, I'll give you one example. If, if you know, I, I wasn't planning on going there because I wanted to talk for a minute on the Messianic, but, but just to bring the point, may, maybe that's, uh, uh, you can look at an example uh, okay, here's a good example. Exodus 12, 49. 
It says there will be one Torah to the citizen and to the girl who is with you. So there are two things that are important about this verse, which, which by the way, it's repeated again in Numbers 15, 15. It says there's one Torah. The Torah is the Torah. But it says that there was a foreign, uh, not foreign, girl and a natural born citizen. It's making a distinction between them. Still the one Torah. And by the way, those from the nations who are in the camp still required. They're still required. You know, you know, right, absolutely. They were circumcised and they had to assimilate into Israel. Israel did not accept their customs. There's no difference. Yeah, it says here in verse 48 that if you are girl, you ought to take part of the Passover. You know, you ought to circumcise your child, you know. Uh, you know, and, and so forth. So, so definitely this, this concept here is... Gerim, it call him Gerim. He's not calling them foreigners. We need to get our terminology right. There is a term that called Nochrim. Nochrim are those really uh, pagans. They are, I don't even like the term Gentiles, to be honest. I love the term Gerim, because Gerim conveyed the right thing. You know, those are, who are Gentiles, truly in the f- true m- meaning of the word Gentiles, uh, and the reason I know that, you know, I'm writing my book now, and I wrote the word Gentiles there, and the editor wrote me back, he said, change the word Gentiles, because it's really derogatory, really, a lot of people take it, and I, I say, I, I take, I, I accept what you say, saying, you know, but those from the nations, in essence, have the two parts to them, okay, but those who are truly grafted in from the nations, as Abraham tells us in, the, in, in Genesis 12, not only that they are part of the restoration of Israel, all of Israel, not only that they are part of Israel, the Messiah is coming through them. So the Mashiach. Absolutely solidified it. With the Jew and the Gentile, if what you're saying, and it sounds so solid, it, the Messiah is coming through the Gentile, it, it's, such a, it's such a paradox. Okay. But now we're getting to the last. Where does the sentence come in that says, and the Gentiles will make the Jews jealous? It's, you see that it's happening? And, I, and, I, and I'm telling. It's happening right now in the Messianic age. That's the third. More people of the nations, if you will, that have brought the word. Oh, ops. Absolutely. Absolutely. But, but that is. Yeah, yeah, but, but Hal, you, you're right, but, but that is not relevant. You see why I'm saying it's not relevant? Let me explain to you why I'm saying it's not relevant. It has no relevance in terms of the calling of Israel. Who brought Israel? Israel still, the, when I say Israel, you're talking about Israel, they still have their calling. They still have this, the, the, the things that they're going to be doing in the world. Okay? That has not happened yet. Israel is not making the impact on the world that they will make in the end on the times of Mashiach. But it's still one Torah. Absolutely, it's one Torah. It's one Torah somehow. But, 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 now, we get, but what we, now we're getting to the heart of the issue. It's one Torah. But look at this one Torah. How is this one Torah? Maybe, maybe I won't get to my last point today. And, and uh, it, that's okay. How is this one Torah was ca- came, came to the Gentiles in, in Genesis? In Genesis 12, in Genesis 12, how is the Torah came? Abraham. Abraham is the one who brought the Torah to the. The Jews still have a role to bring the Torah to the nations. That is the point. How is the Torah was brought in the time of Moses to those mixed multitudes? Well, Moses had to come and deliver them. Again, this come from. The Jewish hands. You see, the role of the Jews are still there. Take it a step further. How did the ultimate Torah, the Torah of Messiah, came to the world? True, a Jew. Who is then Yeshua? That's the ultimate, the ultimate Torah. But now, 
So, so maybe I don't know if I answer your question or not. So you see, the, the point that I'm trying to say, say here is the Gentiles have an... Imp- I don't like the, the gerim. Let's, let's use this terminology from now. The gerim, not only that they have the right, they have every bit of right into Israel, but they're also going to save us some, some purpose here, a great purpose in, into bringing back Israel to the restoration of Israel. But now I want to talk about for a second the messianic, the messianic era. Turn with me real quick to Zechariah chapter 4, verse Zechariah chapter 4, verse 7. This is actually something in my book that I think it's important for you to realize. This is one of the greatest messianic prophecies of all time. Zechariah 4, 7. Somebody would like to read it? What are you, O mighty mountain? Before Zerubbabel, you will become level ground. Then he will bring out the capstone of two shouts of God bless it. God bless it. Stop. Who is the great mountain? Who is the great mountain? According to all the Jewish commentators, the great mountain is the Messiah. This is the Messiah. And it doesn't say great mountain. It says in the Hebrew, the great mountain. The, there, is a, there is a big emphasis in these words here in the Hebrew language. The great mountain. And let me ask you, what will happen to the three great mountains? I'm dealing now specifically with the, the question of the nations on, related to the messianic age. What will happen to this great uh, mountain? He will become what? He become flat. What's the Hebrew word here for the word flat? Mishor. Mishor. What is Mishor? What is Mishor? Mishor comes from the Hebrew word Yashar. What is Yashar? It's talking about becoming straight. Strengthened. He's, he's talking about the fact that this prophecy, he's talking about the messianic age. What Messiah will do? What he will do? He will stra- straighten the nations. He will straighten them up. Okay? You want to know what will happen in terms of the, the nations? Not just strengthen only the nation. He will straighten Israel too. He will be a great mountain and he will come and it will straighten all the ways. You should speak a lot about what? The straight and narrow path. That is a reference that Yeshua is giving us for the straight. The Mishore, the plain, is the straight and narrow path. This is what the reference is speaking. And then it says, then he will bring out the capstone. Isn't that the Rosh Pinah? The Rosh Pinah, yeah. I have an Arishona, yeah. Yes. So you see, what, what we're seeing here, we're seeing this thing. Now, I told you already that in order to bring the true messianic age, we have to be straightened up. How are we straightening ourselves up? How are we straightening ourselves up? How do we, yeah, but what does that mean? How are we straightening ourselves up? I agree with the Orthodox rabbis in this. The only way to straighten ourselves up is come back to Torah. The only way to straight up is come back to Torah. So you see, there is a process of cyclicality here. You want to be straightened up? Go back to Torah. Go back to Torah will cause you to be straightened again in Messiah. But this time, the Torah. So in essence, there is, there is a secondary cycle. First time, there was Torah of Moses. But in the second time, we're talking here about different Torah. We're talking about the Torah of Messiah. That will, yeah, that's the new covenant. That's, that's in, that, and that is exactly what it is. So it is, this, this idea of straightening yourself up is through the new covenant. You see, the new covenant is superior to the Mosaic covenant in that way. It is, it is based on the Mosaic covenant. 
course it's built on it. You cannot, you cannot have this. But what I'm saying when I mean the term superior, what I mean here, I mean that this covenant is empowered by the Mashiach strengthening our door. Okay? It's always the Mashiach. It's always the Holy Spirit that empowers the Word. It's okay. not the Word for the Word's sake. It's the Word because the Holy Spirit empowers. Yeah, but, but, I want, I, I, but, but there is an... Imp- You, you see, this that, that uh, you're absolutely right in that. Matter of fact, you, you, you're right about that, but it's also right from a perspective that we have to return back to, 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 the, living, yes. to, to the living word of God. And in this time, you know, it's going to be truly strengthening up Israel and the nations. I believe it will happen due to all of those things. You see, this time it wouldn't be Abraham who will come. It will be Mashiach come and take each one of us and break us and put, him, put us, each one of us under his heart and graft us right, right into his heart. That's, that's, that's what he has done. We, we, he lives in us. Okay? Rabbi, everything you said, what Hal just said, is in, in, I just want you to hear Galatians 3.8. Okay. Amen. And that is exactly that is exactly the point. What is the gospel that was in advance given to Abraham? That is exactly that's an awesome verse. What's the gospel that was given? It's the fact that those nations were taken, those those in, they were taken and they were foreigners and they were broken to become great Sedek and grafted into Abraham and go to the promises of Israel. That's right, not the other way around. No, that's for sure. Would he s- okay, so what's... I'm sorry, I'm not... Wh- you're asking the chronology of who is it going to straighten... Yeah, I think the Lord wants us to through us to straighten out the nations before he comes. Oh, uh, th- there's absolutely, but the word says that most of, most of the nations will reject him. Read Psalm 2. Most of the people in the world will reject him. They will say, your Torah, it says in verse 4, is like chains on our hands. You're absolutely right. That's why I think it's important for us to get as much as a harvest that we can right now. But we also need to be realistic and say most of the world will, re- will not recognize, will not accept it until the day of judgment. Unfortunately, that will be a tad too late for a lot of people. You're right. So think about this. This is, this is the power, this, this is the importance of the ministry, of why we are involved in what we are. Okay? So, so really... Uh, Today was more n- not a sermon. I don't know. Is this format works okay? Yeah. 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 Well, it's a different. It, it, it's a different thing, you know. Right. It starts with the Lord, it ends with the Lord, and his love letters called the Word of God, the Torah, is empowered by what started with Abraham and the Lord seeking Abraham. Maybe quicker than Abraham Man. seeking the Lord. Yeah, I see your point. Um, where I want to go with this next week... I think we had a wonderful study in Sukkot uh, dealing specifically with the issue uh, when the raptures happen. There was a question about um, whatever the rapture is. We talked about this. You know, I t- told you my, my thoughts about this. It's not a real rapture, you know. You're going up and you're coming straight down. You're going up and coming straight down. But we talked a lot about the roles of the Jews and the nations during this time and I think there were a lot of uh, 
frustrating people, frustrated people that didn't understand it. So I think we got to revisit this. I think today we set the stage to understand that those, and the reason I want to give it to you, is something fundamental. People ask me, what should I call myself? If I am uh, 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 not naturally born Jewish and I'm in the Messianic, should I call myself Jewish? Should I call myself Messianic? Should I call myself Christian? Should I solve, well, what, Jimbo? <laughs> I don't know what to call myself. I think part of the problem in the movement that I'm really realizing is the gen that those from the nation don't know what to call themselves. I think it's, prob uh, it's not healthy. So, so I think one of the things that I want to talk about next week in the next lesson is we're going to paint a picture of what does it mean to be a Ger Tzedek, looking specifically at Cornelius' life and, and, and look at him next week. So we'll, we'll continue with that, okay? All right, let's, uh, can we do a Kiddush, Mark? Can we do a Kiddush? And of course we have lunch and, and let's close with a, let's close with a prayer. Let's, let, let's close with a prayer. Havinu she bashamayim, Eloi Avraham, Yitzchak ve'yakov. We thank you for, uh, for this time today, Abba, of study. Abba, I'm thankful for what Abraham has, has taught us, where he took those families from among the nation, and we make them great tzedek. He brought them into the God of Israel. Abba, help us to find harvest in all the places you have for us, Abba. To the Jew first, and also for the, for the nations, Abba. Thank you, Abba. We ask that this, this time, as we study together and continue this, will be a blessing. Blessings, Abba, to all who are here to be strengthened and to be encouraged. Abba, may this week will bring a blessings, a provision upon us in the name of Yeshua. Amen.